Hi, everyone. Most of us want to be sure we have God's Holy Spirit. I know I do, and I guess you do too. We're talking about God's Holy Spirit. Who and what exactly is the Holy, Holy Spirit of God? This is part two. Uh, we just did part one, and be sure that you check part one before going to this one. Do you understand God's Holy Spirit, as many do, as the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all co-equal, exactly equal to each other? Or do you understand the Holy Spirit as God's power? Last time, I began to show that both of those are either incomplete or wrong. And what's really hard to do is if you've been taught for years and years and years, think of God's Spirit as a separate power to God, of God. God's here, Holy Spirit's over there giving us power, but separate, that is not right. God's Holy Spirit is not separate from God. But one of the things we have to do is be willing to unlearn things we were so sure about in the past if we see from Scripture that our understanding really is not correct. And we have to be willing to replace things we're unlearning. And the Trinity is held so strongly. I'll talk about it again briefly today. The one, you know, if any of the definitions and, and, and descriptions of the Trinity fall apart, then the whole thing falls apart. And to me, the biggest thing that falls apart is saying that the Holy Spirit is equal to God Most High. It's called God Most High because He's Most High. All right? He's the head of Jesus Christ. We'll come back to that. So be willing, I hope, if you believe in the Catholic Trinity, because it was not a doctrine of the church until the Catholics began to teach it in the 300s, under pressure from Emperor Constantine, who wanted the various church groups to come together, united under him. He was an absolute pagan, was not baptized. That, that meant sprinkling in the Catholic understanding until he was baptized on his deathbed. And he did many, many murderous things up till that point. He was not a converted believer of God. So greetings again, anyone. Be sure you, you've heard part one. I'm Philip Shields. I'm the host and founder of Light on the Rock. And I'm glad you're here. Many of you come here from as many as 50, 60, 60 or 70 countries. Thank you for coming. We have a lot of people who are beginning to not just come and watch these, but are responding to them. Many people in Kenya don't even have a cell phone, but somebody there has, and they're showing it to others, or they're talking about it, giving sermons on it. And uh, Africa, East Africa, is certainly booming, just booming in the last few months. This is the uh, middle of 2023 that I speak. And so welcome to Light on the Rock, where God is most high uh, over Christ, and Jesus Christ is our light. He is our rock, and we are light on the rock. And I found it interesting to find much later, after we had picked it to be our logo, that the lighthouse we're using is on split rock. Does that remind you of anything in Moses' day? The split rock, light on the rock, split rock on Lake Superior in Minnesota. Now we have, tell, uh, we have people all over the world who come, and please tell others about this website if you find it helpful to you. The Light on the Rock website has over 400 audio and video sermons and over 450 blogs that is easily accessible by anyone visiting the site. The built-in search feature allows users to quickly search all of the sermons and blogs. Note that any text entered in the search field will be included in the search results. For example, entering Sabbath and Jesus will return all records that contain the words Sabbath or Jesus that is part of a title, summary, or text contained within a blog. Selecting the Advanced Search option, you can further filter the search results. For example, we can search for Sabbath and Jesus that relate only to sermons by selecting Sermon Media from the Search by Type drop-down. To leave comments for any sermon or blog, you must first register and sign into the website. Click on the Sign In button to begin. If you have already registered, enter your username and password and select the Remember Me checkbox so the site will automatically sign you in when you return. Note that if you clear the browser's cache, 
the text file or cookie that stores your login information will be deleted and you will have to sign in again. If you have not yet registered, click on the Don't Have an Account link to sign up. All you need to enter is your full name, a username that will be used when you sign in, a password, and your email account. When you first register, a confirmation email will be sent to you, and once you have clicked on the verification link, you will be able to sign into the site. Please check back often, as new content is constantly being added. Also be aware, on our website, we include sermons uh, on the Holy Spirit. Just type in the two words, 22 things, and it, it should pop up. 22 things the Holy Spirit does in our lives. And I'll put that in the notes as well. 22 things the Holy Spirit does in our life. Actually, we could actually have uh, 30 or 40 or 50 things. <laughs> There's a lot the Holy Spirit does. I also have a sermon called Bearing Fruit of the Spirit. Fruit, not fruits. But the fruit of the Spirit is, it says. And I explain that in the sermon also, why it says that. I think I do. <laughs> but anyway, to find that particular sermon, just type in Bearing Fruit. Bearing Fruit. And the sermon should pop up. Anyway, receiving the Holy Spirit, let's move on. We normally would receive God's Spirit after we've answered the call of God. You didn't choose God, God chose you. God chose to call you. Then we have to choose to accept that calling. And many are called, few are chosen, because a lot of the people called have other reasons not to respond. And so um, once you're called and are baptized by immersion, that's what baptism means, and then you have the laying on of hands you know, where the minister asks God to send the Holy Spirit, his spirit, into your life as the one just newly baptized, probably standing there dripping wet. Acts 2, verses 38 and 39 explains that. What shall we do? Repent and, and be baptized for the remission of sins and receive the Holy Spirit, laying on of hands and all that. Now, the norm, that's the normal sequence. Repent, be baptized, laying on of hands, receive the Holy Spirit. Cornelius, the first Gentiles to be uh, called and baptized, uh, was an exception. In Acts 10, you can read the story about Cornelius and how Paul had this very strange large sheet with all kinds of unclean animals and common animals and, and the voices saying, rise and eat. Peter said, I've never eaten anything unclean or common. I, and then later in chapter 10, Peter explains, now I know what that sheet was all about, that I'm not supposed to call any man common, unclean. That God is working now with Gentiles, just like he was with Jews and Israelites. So we can read how the Spirit, while uh, I think Peter was saying something about those who believe on the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved, boom, just upon hearing those words, God sent the Holy Spirit into Cornelius and his entire household. Uh, they weren't baptized yet. They hadn't had the laying on of hands yet. And so it's not an absolute that it always has to be that way, I guess. But this was an exception to the rule. The rule is be baptized, be immersed in water, and then have the laying on of hands after you've repented and received Jesus Christ. And when we accept the call, it's at that point, I believe, that we become the chosen. God chooses us. God gives us an RSVP. Come to my wedding. When we say, yes, I'd love to be there. I'd be honored to be there. Now you're there. You're, you're, you've been invited to be there. It's not going to change his mind. It's going to finish what he starts in you, Philippians 1.6. But every other time that we read the Holy Spirit, um, excuse me, Every other time we read about the Holy Spirit, it comes after baptism on the laying on of hands, as in the case in Acts 19. You can read about that in verses 4 and 5. Those people had been baptized by John the Baptist, but they didn't know anything much about laying on of, about the Holy Spirit. In Acts 8, Philip goes to Samaria, baptizes a bunch of people, does not lay his hands on them, goes back to Jerusalem and tells them, hey, all kinds of people in Samaria need to have laying on of hands, but I'm not ordained. That must be the only reason I can think of why he wouldn't have laid hands on him. So the apostles in Jerusalem send out Peter and John. I want you to think about the wording there. The apostles, plural, sent out Peter and John. 
I think in the church I grew up in, we put way too much emphasis on Peter being the chief apostle, the head honcho. Uh, they worked by collaboration and they worked together. And uh, I don't know that we can prove that Peter was the one calling all the shots all over the world for the church. He couldn't have done it anyway. Uh, too much distance and too much time. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have all the things we have today. And there were 12 apostles, not just one, plus another five, at least five others, who became apostles like Barnabas, like Apollos, and uh, you know possibly others that became apostles as well. And they worked together. But anyway, so they sent out Peter and John, laid hands on them, and then they received the Holy Spirit. Now, and notice that they were baptized. I'm going to give you a bunch of scriptures here uh, in my notes. They were baptized in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Every single time. They were not baptized, as Matthew 28, 19 apparently says. You shall go to all the nations and teach them to abide by, you know, to keep all things I've commanded you and baptize them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Give me a single time, a single time, where anybody being baptized and having hands laid on them, that that was what was said, what was done. Every single time. We read that they were then baptized into the name of Jesus. Baptized in the name of Jesus. Because the words in Matthew 28, 19, used often by Trinitarians as their number one go-to scripture. There you have the Trinity, they say. Eusebius, a historian from the 4th century, early 4th century, says that was not the original wording in, the, in, in that scripture. That it was about the time of the Council of Nicaea that... Constantine and others wanted them to uh, get their act together and come together, that that changed. And so every other time they were baptized in the name of Jesus. In Acts 8, you'll find that that was true. You'll find that was true in Acts 19, verses 4 and 5. You'll find that was true in every single case. <clears throat> They're always baptized into Jesus because now we're part of him. Romans 6, verses 3 to 6, talks about us uh, being buried with him in baptism. So now when I baptize, and I mean immerse, I mean go underwater, ideally flowing water, I always do it just in the name of Holy Jesus, just in the name of Christ. Acts 2, 38, Acts 8, verse 12, Acts 8, verse 16, Acts 10, 48, always, always in the name of Jesus. I do not baptize, and you should not, if you really understand this, and all the all the examples of what they actually did, proving what I said is correct. From now on, any of you who are baptizing should baptize in the name of Jesus. So a favorite verse of those who want the uh, three-person trinity is Matthew 28, 19. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 goes on to say that we are then immersed into the body of Christ, into the body of Christ by God's presence, by the Holy Spirit doesn't say we're immersed into the body of God the Father. doesn't say we're immersed into the body of the Holy Spirit. No, we're immersed into the body of Christ by his set apart, his Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body, one body. Whether we're Greeks, slaves or free, Jews, whatever, we've all been made to drink into one spirit, one spirit. Romans 12, verses 4 and 5 says, God's Holy Spirit makes us all one body in Christ, just as you have different members or parts of your body, the hand, the feet, the elbow, the eyes, the nose, the ears, but they together form one body. They work together, they come together as one body under one head. And so it's the same thing here. We're one body getting ready to be one bride to marry Jesus Christ. He's not marrying uh, hundreds of thousands or scores of thousands of brides, okay? So the Holy Spirit, as I showed in part one, is how God and Christ, how God and Christ come to live in us like they said they would. If we abide in him, he will abide in us. John 14, 23, 
John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we, my Father and I, we will come to him and make our home with him. Are you getting that? We will come to him and make our home with him. Now, 1 John 4, 13, by this we know that we abide in him. We actually, he doesn't just live in us, we live in God. And he in us because he's given us of his spirit. Whom he has given us. Yeah, I can say whom or he because I, as I showed in part one, God's spirit actually is the very presence of God and Jesus who are somehow extending themselves all throughout their Holy Spirit, wherever the Holy Spirit is going. It's not a third person. It's not separate from God. It's not separate. I showed many examples and I'm trying to prove scripturally in part one. And many examples that seem to give personhood to the Holy Spirit actually was talking about Jesus and Christ. We'll do much more of that today because I want you to absolutely see this. I hope those of you who have accepted the Catholic Trinity will, will see that it's wrong and will be willing to unlearn it or else you just won't understand Holy Spirit correctly. If I'm the one who has to unlearn, I pray for that. I'd be willing to unlearn it. I'd be willing to say I was all wrong. It wasn't the Trinity after all, which was never even taught till the 300s. But anyway, so we are led by God's Spirit. Here's an example, led by God's Spirit. Have you seen the Spirit guiding you, walking, to, walking in front of you, or teaching you, or guiding you? The scripture is clear. The one actually leading us through his spirit is Jesus Christ. The Lord is my shepherd, he who leads us to still waters, who leads us in the paths of righteousness. That's portions of Psalm 23, verses 1 to 3. The Holy Spirit is the parakletos, is the one alongside, the comforter, the helper. So people say, well, there it is. It's separate. It's a separate being who's part of the one God, tri, triune God, the Trinity. And yet, and so they, they describe that as God himself. God himself says, I mean, Paul says that it's God who will comfort you with the comfort he gave you when you were going through hard things so that we can comfort others with the comfort God gave us. God is the comforter using his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, we're told, is the seal and the guarantee, the arabone, the guarantee of our calling, getting finished, that it will be finished to God's glory. And yet Philippians 1.6 says, God is faithful, God the Father is faithful, and he will finish what he started in each of us. So again, I covered those last time. I want to give a lot more this time. Let me just briefly spend a minute or two on the Trinity again. The doctrine of the Trinity didn't begin really in earnest until the early 300s. And there was no real discussion of Trinity in the New Testament. You don't find it. The word's not there anywhere in the Bible. And it wasn't discussed among the early brethren as a big deal. It just wasn't. What is the Holy Spirit? What they discussed, if anything, was who was Christ? We, because some understood uh, the Lord your God is one, is Echad, Deuteronomy 6.4. So who is Christ? Is he really God as well? Can we have two beings that are both God? And that was the big discussion. Finally, the Trinity with the Holy Spirit came into it a couple, a few hundred years later. And again, like I said, the main scripture they used, Matthew 28, 19, just simply wasn't there. They added the, the words to make it sound like Trinity. Uh, let's look at some more examples. The doctrine of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all must be equal for this Trinity doctrine to stand. That is, folks, those of you who believe in Trinity, if you haven't turned me off already, that's one so easily proven wrong. God the Father is the God of Jesus. Ephesians 1.3 Blessed be the God of and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it says. And uh, verse 17 as well. 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. How many of you have heard that preached in church, that Jesus has a God? That his God is God the Father. God the Father doesn't have a God because he's it. He is God. Understand this. Jesus has a God. He said to Mary Magdalene in the garden, I must go to my Father and your Father, to my God, John 20, 17, to my God and your God. Now, so Jesus had a God. They're not equal. John 14, 28, the last part of it says, I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Is that equal? No, it's not. So the whole doctrine of the Trinity falls on its face because you can't prove they're equal. You can easily prove they're not. 1 Corinthians 11.3, I want you to know, 11.3, 1 Corinthians 11.3, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ, the head of Christ is God. That's not equal, folks. So clearly, Father and Son are not equal, and Holy Spirit's not even mentioned in the who's ahead of what. You know, they're equal in being the same kind of being. God the Father and Jesus are both of the God kind. They're not of the angel kind. They're not of the human kind. You might want to write down in your notes the breathtaking, our breathtaking destiny. Just write the word breathtaking. I think that's the title, breathtaking. It'll probably come up, a three-part sermon. If you haven't heard that with those three parts, you really need to. I'm talking about the God kind, the angel kind, human kind, the animal kind, the plant kind. We're all different, okay? Now, one more reminder about the Trinity. The Holy Spirit gets left out an awful lot. John 1, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, right? And the Word was God, the Word was God. And all things were made by this word, and nothing exists that wasn't made by him, it says. God is the creator with Christ, but he worked through Christ to create everything. It doesn't say in the, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and so was the Holy Spirit that was there with the word, and the three of them were there together, and the three of them created everything. People try to make Genesis 1 say that. But right here in, Ephesians, in John 1, verses 1 to 3, the Holy Spirit gets left out. I and my Father are one. John, 20, John 10, verse 30. I and my Father are one. How come he doesn't say, I and my Father and the Holy Spirit are one? He doesn't. And then in uh, John 17, 22, the last part, if you ever see 22b, it means the second part of the verse. John 17, 22b, the last part. Jesus praying here in his high priestly prayer of John 17 at the Last Supper. He prays to God the Father, and he says that they, these 11 left with him, may be one, just as you and I are one perfect place where he could have said just as you and I and the Holy Spirit are one. But he doesn't. And then in all the epistles, when Paul says um, greetings by, by God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ to the church in Thessalonica or Ephesus or wherever, he says, he always leaves out the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say grace and greetings and all that from God the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. He doesn't. So I hope you understand. It falls flat on his face because they're not equal. And the Holy Spirit gets left out. And so I'm hoping you understand. We, it just was never a, an issue until the Catholics added it in in the 300s. Let's talk about holy just for a second now. In the Greek, it's hagios. Translated a lot of times as holy or saints. To the saints, to the holy ones. Saints. In Corinth, in spite of all their many, many problems, he calls them holy ones. In Hebrew, it's kadosh. Kadosh. It's kodesh, if you talk about the word holiness. 
The word holy is kadosh. And one of its primary meanings, meanings is set apart for divine use, for holy use, for holiness. Set apart. So God's spirit sets apart, is set apart from anything else, from all, any other spirit, from any angels. Though they are holy, they're not the Holy Spirit. And holy in the Greek hagios means set apart, sanctified, translated saints. The Hebrew word is kadosh, set apart for God's holy use. So God, we, something becomes kadosh, holy, set apart, when God puts his presence into it or declares it holy for holy use. For example, the Sabbath day, God rested, Genesis 2, the first few verses, God rested on the seventh day. He put his presence in it that made it holy. So when he wrote the fourth commandment with his own finger, God says, keep the Sabbath. Keep is the same word as a keep of uh, where you protect things. Protect the Shabbat. Protect the Sabbath to be kadosh, holy. Protect it to be holy. It's holy time as we remember that this was when God stopped what he was doing. Stopped and rested. And resting is the main meaning of Sabbath. It's not to spend all day in church. It's to rest. Get a nap. Spend time with your kids. You know, spend time with the family. Have a little fun. But it's not a time to do things of the world. Exodus 3, verse 5. Exodus 3, verse 5. Only God's presence makes something holy or set apart for God's use. So when Moses went to see what was happening with this bush that was on fire, but not burning up. God said, do not draw near this place. Take off your shoes, your sandals, off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. So even dirt became holy. Mankind is made of dirt. You may feel dirty sometimes when you sin, but you might have a terrible sin. I might. And I, I still do from time to time, I'm trying to make it less and less. But when we sin, we feel dirty, unqualified, unholy. Yet we as dirt can come before God and, we, and can ask him, can you make this piece of dirt holy, just like you did the ground that Moses stood on? And that's why the priests, by the way, served in the temple barefooted, because they were on holy ground in the tabernacle and in the temple. So even when we sin and repent, even the big, ugly, most awful ones, when God accepts your repentance, yes, even we, dirty we, can be restored and cleansed from every sin, 1 John 1, verse 7 and 9. Every sin. And when we sin, 1 John 2, verse 1, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So we become holy saints set apart once more for God's purpose by his presence in us. That's what makes us holy. That's what makes us holy. God's holy because he's set apart from anything else called God. You become holy because you're now set apart from what everybody else in the world wants to do. We're being called out, ecclesia, with a KK, by the way, E-K-K-L-E. It's the Greek form. The E-C-C-L-E is the Latin form, so I like the Greek form. Ecclesia means called out ones, and we're coming out of Babylon, set apart to be a special chosen, set apart people. And yes, we still stumble, sometimes awfully, but we can get back to God. It is God in us by his spirit, his presence in us, that makes us also a new creation. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 and 17, or if you just have the notes in front of you. Or on the screen if you're watching it. In verse 16, Paul says, you know what? Quit thinking of the way someone used to be. Quit thinking that that woman was such a gossip, probably still is. That one over there was such a drunkard, probably still is, unless they really still are. 
drunkards and womanizers and gossips. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, 16, from now on we regard no one, the ones in the church he's talking about, no one according to the flesh, even though we know, we've known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You may not feel very new when you stumble in sin, but you are. Old, old ways have passed away. The real you now is not the, the one that sometimes follows the leading of the old nature. That's the old you. That's not the real you. Paul said that in Romans 7, around verses 14 to 20. He says, I'm still carnal. Then verse 15, how come I still do the things I don't want to do? Therefore, if I do the things I don't want to do, it's no longer I who sins, but sin that dwells in me doing it. It's not me. Because I'm going to be delivered by Jesus Christ. He goes on to say at the end of chapter 7, in chapter 8, there were no chapters back then. Therefore, now, now there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That whole last part of the sentence, who do not walk according to the flesh, but the Spirit, is left out of all the modern translations, except New King James and the King James. So much is left out of all those modern translations. So much is left out of the NIV, the Living Bible, uh, New American Standard Bible, left out, just not there, or sometimes changed. I don't mean translated, I mean changed, removed. Anyway, the fleshly carnal self, that's not the real me. So you and I can't, we don't want them looking at us thinking we're, we're not changing, we're not being converted. You know, be very careful <clears throat> about saying things like, he's so unconverted or he can't be converted. That's a judgment call. You are judging your brother, and change takes time. We are not to regard anyone in the church any longer according to the flesh. We just read it. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. But regard them, verse 17, as Christ's new creation in Christ, made possible by the presence of this wonderful Holy Spirit. Okay, now understanding the Holy Spirit. Mortal men cannot understand spirit because we're of the flesh. In fact, the things of man you won't understand without the spirit in man that gives us ability to speak and design and compose and have a mind. 1 Corinthians 2. The same thing is true of spiritual things. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 11. The normal mind can't understand spiritual things unless you're given the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is, what is it? God set apart mind and presence. God's holy set apart mind and presence. I'd like to ask you guys, if all you ever say is holy, once in a while say set apart. So you understand. When God says don't touch this or don't do that, or, but do do this. He's setting apart certain things as good and setting apart certain things as bad. It's his divine power. Holy Spirit is God's divine power and his divine nature and his holy seed. And it's God himself showing himself by his presence and the Holy Spirit in us. Holy Spirit is the presence of God himself. 2 Corinthians 13, uh, verse 17, the first part. 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 3, 17. That's what I meant to say. 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And God is Spirit. And God is Holy. The Lord is the Spirit. Then last time I used 1 Peter 1, verses 2 to 4, and I, we're posting it now on the screen. 
But notice the words there that uh, grace and peace be multiplied to you, okay, in the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus, as his divine power, yes it is, has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And verse 4, uh, the last part of that, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. What is God's spirit? Is it God's power? Yes. Is it only God's power? No. It's also God's very DNA, his very nature, what he is. Having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. So right there he talks about power and nature. And in Psalm 139, David asks, under inspiration, Where can I go from your spirit, O God? Where can I go from your presence, O God? If I go to heaven, you're there. You, God, are there. The question was, where can I go from your spirit? Holy Spirit is God, is God's presence. It's not a separate thing. Otherwise, you make your own trinity if you do that. And then in 1 Peter 1, verses 22 and 23, it talks about how we have been born or begotten, the same Greek word. Again, verse 23, 1 Peter 1, 23, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed through the word of God, which lives and abide forever. We're being begotten again by the Holy Spirit. Uh, if we don't have the Holy Spirit, we're not his. Romans 8, 9 says you have to have the Spirit of God in the same sentence that says, or the Spirit of Christ, or you're not even any of his. Romans 8, 9. And so, yeah, the Holy Spirit begets us into the very body into the very kind of God, into the family of God. And the Holy Spirit, then, is God's presence inside of us. Notice it was the Holy Spirit that conceived Mary. It says, the God Most High shall send his Spirit, his power, and you shall conceive a son, and he shall be called Son of the Most High, Son of God Almighty. If the Holy Spirit is a person, a separate third person, I mean, then surely the Father of Jesus Christ should be the Holy Spirit. But no, they say the Father is God the Father, God Most High, using the Holy Spirit. I hope you see the difference. And please, it's not separate. Some of you understand, even those of you who reject the Trinity understand the Holy Spirit is separate. Somehow it's a separate entity out there. No, it's not. That's no different than the that's no different than the Trinity concept, if you if you believe that. So the Spirit of God couples with our spirit, making us one spirit with Christ. That's in 1 Corinthians 6:17. In verse 16, 15 and 16 says, Quit going to the temple, prostitutes. Because when you have sex with another person, you become one with that person. So stop doing that. And then he says that our spirit joins with the spirit of God, making us one spirit. Try to understand that. Just as Adam and Eve, when they came together, became one flesh. We're not one flesh. We are one spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit does. As it comes into us, we become one with God. Now we receive his divine nature, what he's like, so we can grow more and more and more as we respond to this, to be more and more like him. And we receive his divine power, so we have the power to do all kinds of things, to overcome, to resist sin, and to do the right. And we receive God's divine seed. It's not separate from God, though, okay? Now, just for fun, a lot of you probably have enjoyed a particular verse in the Bible that 
let's go to Romans 8, verses 26 to 27, that says, even when we pray, Holy Spirit's involved in that prayer. He's changing our prayer. He's interceding for us. Romans 8, 26 to 27, likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. We don't even know how we should pray, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Wow. If that's all you read, you might have to say, that sounds like a third person, Philip. And on the surface, it can. It really can. Now, this always seemed a bit nebulous to me. What do you mean it searches the heart and that it with words and groanings that cannot be uttered? How does it do that? What does that mean? So sometimes when I, I've always explained it, sometimes when I'm just feeling so hurt and bad, like when my, our son died or something, uh, I, I'll even say, I don't even know what to say, God. I don't even know what to say. And then I'm hoping Holy Spirit is, as I used to understand this, the Holy Spirit is praying for me, with me. Someone who would understand what I was going through would be God. Pain would be Jesus Christ. Feeling rejected would be Jesus Christ, right? The one who really understands humanity. So just six verses later, look what we read. But I don't remember me preaching this six verses later to explain what, what we just read in Romans 8, 26, 27, that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. Verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. I'm reading Romans 8, 34. Romans 8, 34, the last now part of it. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Well, wait a minute, I thought Holy Spirit did. I'm making the point, Holy Spirit is a person. It's the person of Jesus Christ. It's the person of God the Father. Whichever one needs to be doing something. They use their nature, they use their power, they use their spirit to go out there and they are the ones who intercede. They are the ones who speak. They are the ones who act. They are the ones who lead us. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads us in the still waters, paths of righteousness. My sheep know my voice. They follow me. It doesn't say my sheep know my voice and they follow the Holy Spirit. The sheep follow me. It's one and the same thing. Me and Holy Spirit, when Christ is speaking, are one and the same thing. So, in the resurrected form, Jesus is holy. Jesus is spirit. God is holy. God is spirit. 2 Corinthians 3, 17, again, the Lord is the spirit. So that's why I don't mind saying he or whom in reference to the Holy Spirit. So uh, he's the Spirit who makes intercession for us because he's inside of us. Remember I read John 14, 23, uh, my Father and I, we will come and make and come and live inside of you. So he was the one who came down from heaven to simply be a man. He was the one who was rejected. Even the one who betrayed him. His real name is Judah, not Judas. Judas is the Greek form of the Hebrew form, Yehuda, which we translate as Judah. He was betrayed by his tribe, represented by the man who bore their name, Judah. He was the one abandoned, so he is the one who feels our pain and can intercede. Hebrews 7, verses 23 to 25. Hebrews 7, verses 23 to 25. There it says, there are many priests, they were prevented from death, from continuing, verse 25, Therefore he, Christ, is able to save the other uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He lives to make intercession. So this verse in Romans 8, 26, 27, about how the Holy Spirit's groaning for us and interceding for us, and then in verse 33, it says, that interceder, intercessor, is Christ. 
Hebrews 7, I just read it, is Christ. Is that Hebrews 7 or what? Hebrews 7, yeah. Verse 25. One mediator between God and man, the man Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2, 5. We have one advocate between God the Father and us, 1 John 2, 1, that's Christ. If he wants to use this Holy Spirit to do it, great. But it's not a separate person, it's him. More examples where the Holy Spirit is described as Christ in us. The fruit of the Spirit. What well, we read earlier, before, in other sermons, John 15, verse 4 and 5, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. Who's doing it? Philippians 1.11. It's all in the notes and on the screen. Who's doing it? Philippians 1.11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. Fruit of the Spirit is fruit of Jesus living in you. The gifts of the Spirit. We're told in 1 Corinthians 12, after it lists all of them, verse 11, but the one and same Spirit works in all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. As He wills. He, Holy Spirit, is the one distributing the gifts. Doesn't that sound as something different and apart from God? That's what Trinitarians, they use that verse. They, they love that verse. They love all these verses I'm giving you, but they don't explain them correctly or completely. Where do we get good gifts? Those of you who know your Bible well will have a verse pop up right now, James 1, 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes from the Father of lights, in whom there's neither shadow nor turning and all that. James 1, 17. So the gifts of the Spirit, and He gives as He wills, is talking about God the Father. Because, in fact, Jesus said, I forget where it was, might be in Luke 11, where He says, if you want more of the Holy Spirit, ask God. He wants to give it to you. Just ask God for the Spirit. He'll give it to you. God is the one giving the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, do ask that God will help you Learn to use the gift of the whole, gifts of the Holy Spirit to His glory. Don't bury it. Don't, do, don't just do nothing with it. Like the one guy given one talent, which is a weight of money. Uh, he went and buried it. He was afraid to do anything with it. He didn't want to lose it. So he buried. Now, a couple more things I want to say about gift. I need to give a sermon or something on gifts of God's Spirit. A gift is, I'm going to make a note, I am going to give a sermon on that in the next six months. Of course, a gift is something you don't already have. It's something being given to you. Someone might have an existing talent of math talents or music or public speaking or cooking. It could be all kinds of talents that we were born with. Sports, sports talents. And people may refer to that as a great gift, but in fact it's something you were born with. You could, I guess you could say God gave me that gift of being born with, a, being able to shoot a, a three-pointer from 50,000 feet away, you know. <laughs> but it seems to me that a gift from the Holy Spirit is something we did not already possess. It's not the same as having a talent that we were born with. What do you think? Tell me on that. You can certainly ask God to help you use your talents, and you should. But I think, pray that God will ask you to reveal to you what the gifts of the Spirit are that He's given you. And then the important thing is that you use those gifts. Now you find them listed in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 to 11. The word of knowledge, increased faith, the gifts of healing. Well, I'd love to have that gift. The gifts of healing, because so many need healing. I have prayed for some over the many years, and some have been healed even powerfully, instantly. But I wouldn't say I have the gift of healing. The gift of miracles, prophecy, 
that may include public speaking in an inspired way, discernment of spirits, speaking other languages or tongues, interpretation of tongues. Don't know if that's a complete list. That's one we have in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 to 11. You can also go to Romans 12 for more. And Romans and 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, be sure to use the gifts or talents that you've been given. Don't bury them. Paul goes on to explain, though, that unlike you leader-type men, your type A-type personalities who like being in charge, who like leading people, you would love to have the gift of miracles. You would love to have the gift of healing or prophesying, gift of tongues, all of those. Paul says, I haven't mentioned the greatest gift of all yet. And then he goes into chapter 13, and he says, though I can have such faith that I can move mountains. If I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I could speak with tongues of men and of angels, men and of angels, but don't have love, I'm just a noisy, clanging cymbal. Irritating. He goes on to, in 1 Corinthians 13 to finally say, these three, faith, hope, and love. These are the greater gifts. And the greatest gift of all is love. Now, you type A type personalities, especially men, and some women, in the same way, pray for more gentleness. Pray for more love. Pray the Holy Spirit give you that gift of love and faith and hope, tenderness, forgiveness, gentleness. But no, many of you, if you really were honest with yourselves, would pray for the gift of healing, the gift of miracles. They're not wrong. God says they're his gifts. But the greater gift is love. Of course, God gave us, gave us the gift of his very own son, that if we believe on him, we'll have eternal life. Probably the greatest gift of all. Once we have the Holy Spirit and grows in us and comes to maturity, we have eternal life. What a great gift. Father, you're awesome. Great gift. Now, let's talk some more. I want to start wrapping this up, but uh, I, may, I may have to summarize some of this coming up. When God speaks through the Holy Spirit, I actually heard a sermon where a man said, if any of you are hearing words in your head that you should do this or say that, go here, go there. He says, please get your head examined. Something's wrong with you. I wish you'd go tell Peter that in Acts 10, that Peter saw this great sheet coming down. and the, Anyway, the Spirit says to him, there are men at the door. They want you to go with them. They're Gentiles. Go with them. Don't question it. Do it. And he listened. I wish the man who said, get your head examined, would listen to what the apostles said in Acts 13. It says that the uh, prophets and ministers in Antioch were fasting and praying. And the Holy Spirit, which is Christ, spoke to them in their heads somehow, some way. They all got, five, six, seven of them, however many there were there, they all got the very same words. Separate for me, Paul and Barnabas. I have work for them to do. Philip was told, go towards Gaza. Oh, now the Holy Spirit said, run and catch up with that chariot. You need to explain about the Messiah, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. And I've heard God's voice at different times. Real clear words. Sometimes it's just nudges and strong feelings. But various times in my life, I remember I've told you this before. On my way to bed one night, it was 2 a.m. I turned off my computer. As I got halfway to the bedroom, I got this really, really clear message. Go check your email. Just as plain as that. I, if you were standing with me, you wouldn't have heard it. It was in my head. Go check your email. I paused for a second. I thought, that's strange. So I went another five or six feet, and then it was, I said, go check your email. It was just like that. 
I'm telling you guys, if you disregard those, you'll quit having them. Test the spirits. There's nothing wrong with me checking the email. So I did. Turned on the computer, and there was someone who said she was hoping and praying that I would call her. She needed me to talk to her so badly. She was nine time zones away from where we lived. So it was early morning her time. It was 2 a.m. my time, mid-morning her time. But anyway, when I called her, she started crying. She said, I'm, I'm just sure God doesn't hear my prayers anymore because of a decision I'm making. I said, you got to be kidding me. Here's what just happened. I told her what I just told you. You don't think God's hearing your prayers? Now, what's the issue? She told me the issue. I assured her God was okay with that. Or else he wouldn't have made me come and talk to her at 2 in the morning. Someone I never talked to in my life. I've had that happen several times with several people. And there are lots of times I'll pray for, okay, where am I going with this sermon? What do you want me to say in it? Show me, please, where you want me to say. I, I'm doing that by my bed. I've got a pad of paper. So many times. I've I'm, I'm kind of hit a roadblock, don't know where to go with it. I, I, think, I don't think it's really saying the right things to me or I'm saying the right things. And I can't stop writing all of a sudden. And that becomes the sermon you hear. I'm just telling you, I'm hearing God's voice. He hasn't gone mute for you. You haven't turned on his channel. <laughs> You're on the wrong channel. Maybe the word channel is the wrong word to use. The wrong station, like the old radio stations. You have to dial those in, you know. God wants to talk to you. Give him that opportunity. Now, in Revelation 2 and 3, you have the seven churches. I'll just have you recall this. At the end of every message to all seven churches, each church, we are told, let him who has an ear, like Romans 2 verse 7, for example, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What the Spirit says to the churches. So it sounds like we're supposed to hear the Holy Spirit talking to us. But again, who is the one actually speaking? If you go back to the last 10 or 15 verses of chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, you'll find that John is in the Spirit on the Lord's day, the day of the Lord, a day coming up ahead of us. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. I am Alpha, I'm Omega, I'm the first and the last. Write what you see in a book. Send them to the seven churches. And then I turned, I saw, uh, to see the voice that was speaking to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. And in verse 16, he had a sharp sword out of his mouth. His countenance was like the sun. And then he says to them in verse 17, uh, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. Verse 18, Revelation 1, verse 18. I am he who lives and was dead and am alive. So obviously it's Jesus. Now you continue. There were no chapter breaks back then. Revelation 2, verse 1. Now the angel to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says the Holy Spirit. No! In this case, the Spirit who was talking to them was Jesus. He also is spirit. He also is holy. But it says, you know, it said in uh, the one I read to you earlier, um, Revelation 2, verse 7, uh, there it says, uh, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit. Who is the Spirit? 2 Corinthians 3, 17. The Lord is the Spirit. And now we find out in Revelation 2, verse 1, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of seven golden lampstands. Who is that? That's Jesus. That's Jesus. Verse 8, uh, Revelation 2, 8. After saying here what the Spirit, in this case the Spirit is Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3, 17. The Lord is the Spirit. It's not a separate entity. 2.8. These things says the first and the last. 
He who was dead and came to life. Who's that? That's not the Holy Spirit. That's Jesus. So I hope you're seeing what I'm saying. That so often when we see and read about Holy Spirit, we think it's some separate entity. Don't make it separate from God. Holy Spirit is God, is Jesus, working in us, talking to us, leading us, guiding us, overcoming in us, changing us, changing me and changing you until we grow to be perfectly in his image, in his likeness. Because what God the Father sees is Christ in us who is now our life. Not that I, Philip Shields, in the flesh will ever be perfect. But in the spirit, I am. Because my life is Jesus. And he's perfect. He's sinless. You need to see that so you have the joy of salvation. Don't fight that. Holy Father, we raise our hands, as you said in 1 Timothy 2, to raise holy hands in prayer. I'm doing that. Moses did that. Solomon did that. David did it a lot. Paul taught it. Yeshua, Jesus, in your holy name, please pour out on all of us your holy anointing of your Holy Spirit, your set-apart spirit. Reside in us, Christ. Reside in us by your Holy Spirit just like you explain in the scriptures I've been reading. That you and Father reside in me and I reside in you. By your Spirit, somehow. Still don't fully understand how that all works. I know it's not a third person equal with God the Father, who's most high. We know that. We see that now. I pray that those who are still struggling with giving up the Trinity, the Catholic Trinity, you will open their minds to see this truth that you're showing, dear God. That you are the Spirit. You are the one living in us. You are the one who leads us. You're the one who speaks to us. You're the one who intercedes for us. You're the one who gives us power to overcome and resist sin. You're the one who gives us your very divine nature so we can grow to be more loving, more kind, to be just like you. Oh God, we love you. We praise you. We ask for your divine spirit now to be in us and upon us and working in us. We love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. We ask your dismissal now in Jesus' name. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference, for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others. <music>